I've called this mini-lecture Malice of Forethought. That's just a witty pun, you know, that's only going to amuse the pre-law students in this class. I'm sorry, I'm afraid there probably are not any pre-law students in this class, and that's really a big shame. Obviously, lawyers should know some physics. But it does tell what the lecture is about. And it's not mal is, it's mal us. I don't know anything about that guy, but he did come up with one crucial law that we're going to use, not a law in the law books, a law of physics. That means a real solid law, which we need to learn about today. It starts with three-dimensional nature of electromagnetic waves. Are, is your hand already tired, your right hand, from trying to figure out these right-hand rule problems? Mine's getting a little bit tired here. But we have to re-examine this, and there's a diagram you've now seen many times up here. See where the cursor is pointing to the E and B fields? Now, in this particular case, it's a kind of a textbook case. We've made everything really simple here. And I have to now expose you to the fact that we oversimplified things a little bit with always giving you these very easy orientations of E and B. That was to get you warmed up to using the right hand rule. But now I'm going to lift the veil here and admit that we have a more complicated case in nature generally. But this boils down the essence of it right here. So typical problem in the earlier part of this course you take the orientation of the E vector and the B vector. You can see E is going in the z-axis, B is going in the minus y-axis. You take your right hand out, <coughs> limber it up, and curl your fingers over from the E to the B, and you find, low and hold, which way is your thumb pointing. Your thumb is pointing over to the right on the plus x direction because that is the direction of the propagation of the wave. That's the direction of the pointing flux. It's E cross B, and everyone's happy. This looks like an absolute standard textbook diagram except how did we decide the answer to a more complicated problem, which I haven't given you yet. What if I had just told you that you have an electromagnetic wave that has to obey Maxwell's equations, it has to obey E cross B, but I only told you this. I just said that the electromagnetic wave is traveling in the plus X direction. It's moving along in the right-hand direction along that axis. And then I asked you to tell me which way E is or B you might uh, draw a diagram like this where you put E going up the plus Z and B going uh, over the minus Y direction at the same time and you get full credit. That would be correct because it would satisfy E cross B as the direction of the wave. But uh, how did you decide that? It seems like you could have had the E going in a different direction so long as it's perpendicular to X and then so long as B is perpendicular to E there would be a lot of ways of satisfying a wave that could travel in the plus x direction. And now I have to tell you, this is only just one way that you could solve it here. It's a very special way. This is a particular wave that satisfies going in the plus x direction with E going vertically in the plus z direction. So this particular wave, we would say that the E vector, which is the one we usually pay attention to here, is polarized in the plus z direction. And this is, a, I'm going to give you a perfectly good analogy here, a mechanical analogy. It's simpler, it might help to learn it. What if we have our classic rope under tension and you've got your hand on one end of it and you're wiggling it to send transverse waves down the rope? So the waves are, of course, electromagnetic radiation doesn't need a rope. It doesn't need any medium. It can propagate in a vacuum. But this rope is an analogy. Well, you have a lot of choices what you can do with your hand there. Better use your left hand. Your right hand is probably exhausted by now. To your left hand, you can wiggle it, for example, in the first case here. You can wiggle that hand up and down like that. And that'll send waves, which are all vibrating in the vertical direction, down the rope. This is, of course, satisfying a transverse wave because the displacement is vertical. The propagation is perpendicular to it. No problem. But, of course, you could have also wiggled, I'm sure you're dexterous enough to do this, you could wiggle your left hand sideways here, and then that would displace the rope in a perpendicular direction, but it's still perpendicular to the same propagation of motion. And so either one of these, this uh, vertical wiggle, this sideways wiggle, is going to be a, a legitimate wave. And of course, this could be the electric field here in our analogy. The electric field could be vibrating this way, could be vibrating this way, so long as it's vibrating perpendicular to this propagation direction. And 
anything in between. I could vibrate this thing at a kind of an angle, like 45 degrees or 60 degrees. And that uh, is a little bit more complicated than what you saw in this simple diagram here. Uh, I don't, it's kind of messy if this thing is going to be at 45 degrees. Let's see what that looks like. Well, here's an example. So this is already uh, obviously a solution to Maxwell's equations. E cross B is the plus X direction. What if I just rotated things over, tip things over, looks like about 30 degrees here. Now E is rotating in some combination of the Z, E is vibrating in some combination of the Z, Y plane. B will be fine as long as it's vibrating perpendicular to that somewhere in the ZY plane, and you still have E cross B is equal to plus X direction. So this is a perfectly legit solution to Maxwell's equations for a wave going in the plus X direction, just like this one. Either one of them is perfectly okay. Just the same way I can vibrate a string any different direction I want perpendicular to the direction of motion. And the only difference between these two waves is the direction where the E vibrates. In other words, these two waves are what we call polarized, but this one is polarized along the Z direction. This one is polarized, it looks like, about 30 degrees off of the Z direction. And here's the fun part. When you look in most situations in life, you're looking not at a special situation, like just waves that all have this polarization, or this particular one. In general, in life, what you find is natural light. That's a technical term. All of these technical terms that have uh, human kind of analogies. Anyway, the technical scientific term for natural light means it has no preferred polarization direction. What do I mean by that? I mean that when you look at light, it's all traveling in the plus X direction. You're simultaneously looking at many different waves with E vibrating in all different directions in the ZY plane, all different directions perpendicular to the X direction. And that is natural light, and it's unpolarized. Well, it's a combination of many little polarizations, all in different directions, which add up to having no favored different direction. Ooh, boy, no wonder we didn't draw that in the book. What a messy diagram, um, you know, totally beyond my artistic ability. Hmm, well, the whole point of this lecture is what if we could simplify things, though? You have natural light, for example, what comes from the sun, what comes from a light bulb. Natural light is coming in with E, a whole bunch of different waves vibrating in all different directions. E's like that, like that, like that, every different angle. And then we need some kind of sorter, some kind of way to pick out one particular polarization and leave the others behind so we can get back to a simple polarized wave. Well, that would be called a polarizer, and they're actually not that hard to get. They're not that expensive to buy. You can find them, for example, in most pair of sunglasses. Of course, if you're paying a lot of money for sunglasses, that's just because you're paying for some fancy designer name, whatever. The Polaroid itself is cheap, and you're just wasting a lot of money. So here is a mechanical analogy, again, for a wave propagating transverse wave on a uh, rope under tension. Suppose that you had a slot in a wall here, and the slot is, in this case, vertical. Then it looks like it's only going to allow the rope passing through it to vibrate up and down vertically. If you try to send 90 degrees polarized the wrong way, this is polarized horizontally, it's going to run up to the slot or the polarizer, and it's going to not be able to vibrate here, so the wave will die. So this polarization goes through untouched, and this polarized wave is blocked by the filter. So this filter has a particular orientation. We can say that that's the transmission angle of the filter. And if you try to go 90 degrees away from that transmission angle, you are totally absorbed. This is an ideal polarizer. This is just a mechanical analogy. In fact, what you really have to imagine is, all, is a whole superposition of many, many strings, many ropes vibrating simultaneously up and down, sideways at an angle, all going through here. Some of them get through a little bit. Some of them get through not at all. And now, just imagine that with electromagnetic waves, where this might be an elongated molecule that has electrical properties that transmit preferentially in the transmission axis of the, what we call the Polaroid, or the polarizing filter. Here's an example of a Polaroid. This is actually a sheet of the stuff that comes out of the factory. And it works just like I said. And it's interesting, you can see very clearly, we're in a room that's just surrounded by natural light. That means there's no particular polarization of the light that's coming off that wall. 
or coming off the floor here. Except notice, when it tries to pass through this polarizing filter, some of it passes through, some of it doesn't pass through. Now I'm going to skip ahead and tell you the answer here. Half of the light that came from the wall in back gets through and half of it is absorbed because it was unpolarized light trying to go through a Polaroid. Wow, I could say that. I don't even know which way the polarizing transmission axis of this Polaroid is. They should have an arrow somewhere on the package to show which way it's polarized, but uh, I don't have to know that. Regardless of which way it is, the unpolarized light, half of it will come through, half of it will be absorbed. So that sounds like we're ready to get quantitative. And solving problems is what this course is all about, right? You didn't really need this Physics 6C course at all of, to have a you know, qualitative understanding of what I just told you. So let's get quantitative now because this is what's going to prepare us for homework problems and ex exam problems and MCAT problems. By the way, this is not going to be on the exams, but it is so fascinating. There are some wonderful materials that are even more interesting than Polaroids. There are natural crystals that, because of their internal molecular structure, take, treat the two different polarizations of light differently and split them. This is so cool. So there's light rays coming through here unpolarized from that sheet there. Seems to say something about Mexico because I guess that's where the calcite was found. And the two polarizations travel different paths as they go through the calcite and they're split here. Your eyes, are, you're not hung over here or whatever, your eyes are not deceiving you. There are two different images. This is one polarization, that's the other polarization. How cool is that? Anyway, we're not going to ask you questions about calcite. So useful though, I love that stuff. Here's the basic idea as best as we can draw it. A complicated situation, there's our approximation of unpolarized light. The light is all traveling along this plus x axis here from left to right, and it starts out coming in as natural light. That means it starts out coming unpolarized, which means here, I forget the b vector, it's too complicated. The b is, comp is perpendiculous. I've just got a schematic little red arrow for each of the e vectors, how they oscillate in space. Is this OK? Yeah, because all of them are perpendicular to the propagation direction. So all of these are legit. Here, you got some E vibrating vertically, some is uh, horizontally, some is uh, 30 degrees away, 60 degrees away. There's a whole combination of every possible angle here, and they're all mixed in equally, which means natural light. It's unpolarized until it hits the polarizer. And what I just told you, I haven't explained why, I just told you, just taking on my say-so right now, is that you send all these rays in through a Polaroid. Just for fun, I have the Polaroid tilted at this particular axis, but I could have tilted it any direction. And what I get out at the other side is half of the original intensity. Original intensity I naught, that's what we'll typically use, that's a good number. What comes out is I naught over two, half of the intensity. And the difference is we have totally sorted the polarizations. Before, we had completely random polarization directors. After, the light that comes through, all of the E vectors are totally lined up in this particular direction along the transmission axis of the Polaroid. That is pretty cool you know, for a 10 buck uh, piece of Polaroid filter. Excellent. That's an ideal Polaroid. And the stuff you can get in a good store is pretty close to ideal. It almost gives you exactly pure polarization in the direction it's supposed to. And that is great. But what does this mean here? I had all these different electric field orientations coming in, and I only lost half of them. I went from I naught to I naught over 2. So a lot of the light went through, not just this one. You might just say, well, sure, that one's going to get through just like the rope going through the slot. It's lined up exactly with the transmission axis. I expect that one to get through. This one, I don't think so. That's 90 degrees off. That's no hope of getting through. The question for this class, really the question of the whole day here is, what about these rays here? That one, that one, that one. They're not exactly on the transmission axis, but they're not exactly off it either. They're somewhere in between 0 and 90 degrees alignment. Well, you can see from this example here, and this is the money, some of them get through partly. Not entirely, not 100%, but not 0% either and it averages out to 50% of them getting through. Now, let's look at the formula which describes this. Malice's Law. There's your formula right here. That's the one formula you have to know for today's lecture. So same situation as before, except now I rotated the Polaroid to have its transmission axis straight up. Obviously, 
the unpolarized light comes in, the straight up rays like this, where the E vector is vi vibrating vertically, are going to come straight through. A little piece of some of these rays are going to get through. The net result is, on the other side, you have half the intensity surviving. Half the intensity passes through, and it's perfectly polarized vertically along the transmission axis. And now here's the question where malice comes in. Actually, malice already came in there, but malice really comes in here. Malice's law really tells you what happens when you send purely polarized light through a ideal polarizing filter. That's the question. So you put polarized light in to a filter. You have a transmission axis which is not necessarily the same as the polarization axis of the input light. In fact, it's different by an angle theta. See that? We rotated this Polaroid, so now its transmission axis is theta degrees away from the polarizing coming in. So theta is the relative angle here of the incoming polarized light compared to the transmission axis of the filter, and you want to know, okay, looks like I'm going to lose some more light. I, I have this polarized light here, uh, it's I naught over 2, but unfortunately I did not line up the transmission axis with it. So I don't think it's all going to come through. We're not going to get I naught over 2 coming through. We're going to lose more because of the second polarizer here. And the question is how much more? And the answer is we lose more. There's your half I naught coming in. We lose more by this malice factor. Cosine squared of theta should make pretty good sense. You might be wondering, well, why is it cosine squared? I wouldn't remember that. Uh, I'm not going to derive it in this class, but I'll just tell you the reason for it is that light intensity is proportional to the square of the electric and the magnetic fields, as you may recall. That's where the square comes from here. But qualitatively, this might make sense. Let's look at it. Let's break it down here. What's the best you could do if you didn't want to destroy any of this light with your second Polaroid here? Make malice work for you. What would you want to do? You'd want to make this factor as close to 1 as you could so that you let all of the light that comes in come out. How would you do that? Is that possible? Sure, it's possible. How do you get cosine squared theta to be 1? You take theta to be 0 or 180 degrees. Either way, cosine squared is going to be 1. All the light that comes in will come out. That's trivial. You already kind of knew that. That's kind of just by definition. So at least Malice Law is not idiotic, right? It's consistent with what we just said earlier. Let's look at another real simple case. What if I'm uh, perverse or I want to block out all of these rays? Maybe it's a glare uh, and I want the sunglasses to block it. Then is there a way that I can rotate the transmission axis so that no polarized light comes through? I can block all of it out, absorb those rays out completely, make this be zero. Here, could I have zero out? Let's see. What does cosine theta have to be? Obviously, cosine theta has to be zero. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible for two particular angles. What are those angles? Cosine of 90 degrees, yep, is zero. Okay, and cosine of 270 degrees. So either pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 for theta, and nothing, since this is an ideal Polaroid, nothing, zero, will get through. Your I that gets transmitted is zero. Well, that's just trivial, too, because we already said that if you were to rotate this transmission axis to be 90 degrees away from the polarization angle, it blocks everything. That's when you have your slit completely perpendicular to the polarization of the waves coming in. So this law works exactly like it's got to work for theta equals 0, 90, 180, 270. That's obvious. The thing that's not obvious, and the reason why you have to know this law, is it also works for other interesting angles like 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, kind of angles that will give you in problems on the homework and the exams here. The formula still works exactly well. So as long as you got your cosine, uh, factor on your calculator, you'll be able to use Malice's Law to solve actual problems. So this is the money formula for today. The only formula for today. You got this. You can solve all kinds of problems. Now, here's a problem I'm not going to give you. This is a little complicated, but you might be wondering. Malice's Law explains everything. It's so wonderful. It even explains, if you break it down carefully, it even explains 
why unpolarized light, yes, I know Malice's law is about polarized light coming in, but it even explains that unpolarized light, half of it's going to get through. Why is that? Just so you know. Because unpolarized light is what we call a superposition, a combination of polarizations of all these different angles, every different angle around the circle. And so what you really have to do, and it's a calculus problem, so we won't do it, you would have to use Malice's law on each of these arrows individually, add them all up, that's called an integral, and see what comes through. And you end up with an integral, or average value of cosine squared theta, and I'm just telling you, in case you don't know, um, from freshman calculus, the average, or the integral, over an entire circle of cosine squared theta is one half. So Malice's law actually could be used to prove that half of unpolarized light makes it through the polarizing filter. But we're not going to have such a fancy problem like that. We're going to have simple problems where the input light into the filter is already polarized in an axis that I'll give you, and we'll give you the transmission axis. All you have to do is tell me what comes out. All right. Now we're ready for our first not-too-hard problem to make sure did you get this? This is our gut check time. Now, I actually expect you on this lecture to sit down and solve this problem or solve in your head and write down the answer somewhere. So I'm not actually going to go forward with the lecture until I've gotten an answer from you to this problem. Here is the question. It's a very simple question. Use this formula here. Use Malice's Law. Let's see if you understand it well enough to handle this particular problem. I'm going to keep it pretty simple. We send polarized light in with an initial intensity. You can figure out what that's going to be or make it up, whatever. And then it passes through a polarizing filter, which is tilted by theta equals 45 degrees. Not this diagram. Suppose we tilt, rotate it more to where the transmission axis was about there. So the transmission axis is about 45 degrees away from the input polarization angle. Here's my question. How much intensity of light do you get on the transmitted side coming out using this formula? And by the way, which way is the light polarized, if it is at all, when it goes through the other side of that polaroid? I'm just going to wait here now and stop the lecture until you come up with an answer, in which case you may proceed with the lecture.